Hello and welcome to Unleashed. Unleashed is produced by Umbrex. You can find us at umbrex.com. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I am so thrilled to be here today with Jimmy Sony, who is the author of a bunch of books, including The Founders, The Story of PayPal, and The Entrepreneurs Who Shaped Silicon Valley. Jimmy, welcome to the show. Will, thank you for having me, and thank you for the very generous and kind introduction. So, Jimmy, why do we have the PayPal mafia? Why is that a term? Why is it not, you know, the eBay mafia or the Google mafia or the AOL mafia or some other, you know, startup mafia? What is special about PayPal? Yeah, it's uh, it's a great question. It's one of the questions that's at the heart of the book. It was one of the questions that, frankly, led me into the story. You know, you you have plenty of successful companies. Why is it that this company produced the alumni it produced, the founders of LinkedIn, YouTube, SpaceX, Tesla, et cetera, et cetera? And to get to the, the, the direct answer to the you know is a, is a the long answer to the question, but one of the big uh, a few of the big reasons one. Most of these people were pretty young when PayPal was successful. And by successful, I mean they built the company and then it IPO'd and then was acquired by eBay. Two, when they emerged from that experience, you know, the, the, the dot-com bubble had just finished bursting. You know, people are only starting to renew their faith in the internet and there was still a lot of skepticism. But they had faith that you could make an internet company work and make it successful. And then three, and this is really critically important, a lot of the early companies that came out of the PayPal alumni group were, you know, invested in by other PayPal alumni, were supported by other PayPal alumni. The first employees were other PayPal alumni. I spoke to PayPal alums who left PayPal, you know, worked at eBay, the, the acquiring company, for a little while, and we'll get a call from a friend, and who the friend was creating a company called YouTube, and so they went over to YouTube. Um, the first money into Yelp, what became Yelp, came from a PayPal alumnus, Max Levchin, who gave the money to a fellow PayPal alumnus, Jeremy Stoffman. Um, and so you had this very dense network where people were supporting one another after this very difficult experience of bringing PayPal to scale, building it, bringing it to scale, and then selling it. So it sounds like part of it was this the highly talented group that was assembled it was also partly a little round timing. You know, Gladwell talks in, in one of his books about how all the big tech entrepreneurs, you know, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and so forth, a lot of them were all kind of at, of a same age where computers were just coming into the availability um, and they were able to learn from that. It sounds like there was something similar at work here where they emerged with the experience of a startup and some money and it was a good time. I think that's right. Let, let's go into it a little a little bit more deeply, because I, I want to talk for a second about the timing piece. It's, it's interesting you mentioned that. It's one of the big things that, in the conclusion of the book, I identified because I had heard it from the people I interviewed. Right? Actually, it was Peter Thiel. There's a great quote at the end about how he says, "You know, if we like a, a few years later, there might not have been room to create a company like PayPal, and a few years earlier, we wouldn't have been able to create it." It's something to that effect. I'm paraphrasing, but he 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 put one of you know i asked him sort of what were one of the keys to success and he said well part of it is we had the right timing we were there right when email addresses had become more ubiquitous so that people could you know send money over email they became successful on a platform ebay that hadn't figured out its payment infrastructure and so they had an opportunity there to like take advantage of that and then they managed to survive during the dot-com bubble bursting make it through and IPO and sell the company right as faith in the internet was being restored. So you had this sort of like powerful experience. It was four years of duress. That's part of it. I would say the other kind of two pieces you sort of hinted at. One is PayPal selected for really talented people, right? I mean, this is a room that contained Elon Musk and Reid Hoffman, David Sachs, Max Levchin, you know, on and on. I mean, you can go through dozens and dozens of names of really gifted people so some of that is sort of the nature nurture thing. Like they pre-selected for very, very, very smart people who had a kind of entrepreneurial bent about them. And then part of it is nurture. All of these people, even if it was their first job out of college, they were seeing the experience of what it means to put a company together from scratch and then have it be a success. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cocktail, right? It's hard to say one thing. It's not sort of like, oh, they all read this one book and that's why there's a help mafia, right? It's actually like a mix of things and it's the entirety of the experience that shaped this generation of entrepreneurs. 
one thing I love about this book is that it shows how messy a real company can be, how they started out, uh, Confinity, one of the two companies that merged really, was initially was fooling around with this idea of beaming money from one Palm Pilot to another. And in retrospect, that just seems so ridiculous that now the kind of Palm Pilots have disappeared and that it was only, you know, email payments were only kind of an afterthought. And uh, what has studying this and telling the story taught you about this, you know, about strategy, about the Silicon Valley kind of idea of pivoting, um, and about just the messiness of how companies actually grow? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I'm, I'm really glad you asked it. I, I would say, like, looking back and, and having learned how this company came to be, and I would say more importantly, having learned that, you know, people who are regarded today as like the ruling class of Silicon Valley, like the, you know, some of the smartest people around, seeing how much difficulty they had in creating something it leads it leads at least in my head like my day-to-day -day interactions it leads me to two kind of thoughts the first is like building a company from scratch is much harder than people think and and that seems kind of obvious except that we really take for granted a lot of the companies that occupy our lives right that actually like the the, the exercise of, of doing a startup or building something new is difficult the second thing it makes me realize made me realize this experience was things that seem inevitable can often look ridiculous at the start, right? So we, you joked about this Palm Pilot, you know, beaming and, and just to give listeners context, one half of the company that became PayPal, its first com consumer product was this idea that, that you would beam money between the infrared ports on Palm Pilots. And there's probably a fraction of listeners that remember what a Palm Pilot is, but think of it as like a primitive iPhone, right? The first PDAs. Um, and what happened is that that product was actually labeled like one of the 10 worst business ideas of 1999. And that is the company that became PayPal, a company that is still around today. And the last time I checked, I think it's market cap is something like in excess of $100 billion. And so you have this, this thing of things that look can look silly and ludicrous at the beginning could turn out to you know, create teams and products that look inevitable later on. And I think what it's led me to is just be a little bit, a little bit more humble about rushing to judgment or about mocking something just because it seems silly or quaint. It also kind of takes away or helps inform this idea that we have that it's typically the straight line where someone has this genius idea and then boom, like Airbnb, oh, they hosted someone on their couch, they had this idea, why don't we do this? And you know, Airbnb, boom, where where just they. They kind of went very this very circuitous route to uh, to the idea of sending money, and Elon Musk was trying to build this financial super center where it would consolidate every single aspect of your financial life, your assets, your banking, your investment banking, and uh, eventually they landed on you know payments via email. Yeah, I think that's the, the circuitous is the best word for it. Um, and if anything, it, that you know sort of undersells it a little because the way I describe the story of the creation of PayPal is basically the story of like near failure followed by near failure followed by near failure. And and I think if you look back at the trajectory of a lot of companies, that is exactly the way it is that you sort of see a thing, it doesn't work, you improve upon it, you improve upon it, you improve upon it, and then all of a sudden the idea has some merit to someone, right? You're sort of adding value for someone. And and I, and then by the way, this was like a learning experience for me because I'm a PayPal customer. I go online, I type in my email address, I press send. I'm like, how hard could this possibly be, right? Um, but it turns out that when you build a payment system, you have to fight really hard for, on, on, on at least two fronts. One front is this, how do you get people to use this payment mechanism when it's never existed before, right? Like, what's the reason? What's the incentive? How, why, are, why are masses, millions of people going to use it? The second challenge is, how do you make sure that the people using it are legitimate? And how do you make sure they don't defraud you? And so there's sort of two halves of the company's life. The first half is getting to enough scale to matter. And the second chat, sort of like half of its life, early life, is figuring out how to make sure that people don't take advantage of it and drive the company into bankruptcy. And I think that, to me, that's like actually like one of the, the great things about this story is that you had a company that, again, its product seems so simple, almost inevitable, and it was a, a dogfight to create it. Related to this topic of messiness is this issue of contingency. 
Um, so Peter Thiel secures $100 million in funding something like a week before the market crash of 2020. And then another one is the CEO, Bill Harris, gives Elon Musk this ultimatum that to agree to the 50-50 merger between X.com and Confinity and forces Musk's hand. And if no merger, you know, maybe neither company ever achieves a scale. Maybe they both die in the dot-com bust. What are some of your insights just around contingency uh, from this story? Yeah, I think um, I would say that part of a a, a sort of the, the startup story is is learning to live with just sort of an an unbelievable amount of anxiety and uncertainty. Um, that there are, there are so many different crucible moments. And again, I only deeply dove into this particular startup, but in the course of doing this book, I studied a lot of other startup stories. And almost all of them have this kind of do or die moment where there's a single decision or a couple of decisions that are the really, really, really consequential ones. In fact, it, in later speeches, uh, I think Peter Thiel has actually said really like the best CEOs only make maybe like six important decisions a year or something like that. Um, and so I think I think for me, you know, those moments and they are fraught, by the way, like there, there was no there was no PowerPoint deck really that you know, could have sort of gamed out a perfect solution to any one of those moments. But I think that there is value in knowing, let's say you're about to join a startup. Let's say a lot of your audience, you know, uh, consultants, maybe maybe they decide they want to take, take, uh, take a risk and join a startup, but they're not going to found anything necessarily, but they want to join something that's fast growing and that's ready to scale. I think if you go in eyes wide open, you have to know that there are moments when you're going to wake up and think the company might go under the next day. And that's not a that's not a comfortable feeling. Like, quite honestly, I'm not sure I could live with that feeling, right? And and so I think to, to to sort of step out of the business context, a lot of that affects people personally. Like, a lot of the company's life cycle in its first four years is having to manage and tolerate uncertainty and respond to these fears essentially by creating great products and trying to just stay alive for the next day, right? Um, and so I, it, it's a little it's a little tough to have sort of a theory of the case about contingency because I'm not even sure the people who live the story would have recognized those moments as like do or die moments, right? Where the company might not have survived if they didn't close the hundred million dollar round. In fact, the funny thing about interviewing all these people is that only only later, in some cases, did they appreciate like just how contingent everything was, right? Um, but I think what it taught them is that a lot of what can look from the outside in like chaos, like in the middle of a startup, what can look like chaos is actually like the kind of churn you need to have new and interesting ideas spring up. And it's not always perfect. Sometimes chaos is just chaos. But in the case of PayPal, you had this controlled chaos that was directed at the right problems and issues. Um, but I think that's like the, the bigger lesson is probably personal or psychological, which is being in a startup environment, at least in as much as I have learned from doing this book, is about just learning to live with wave after wave of uncertainty. Elon Musk. Some people recently have talked about Elon Musk buying Twitter, and I've seen comments online like, oh, he's great at building you know, Tesla and SpaceX and physical world companies with actual atoms and products, but he's out of his element dealing with the tech company, which is kind of hilarious because he built and sold two very successful tech companies you know, PayPal and before that, um, Zip2. W what's your take, you know, having met Elon Musk and studied his management style, gotten to know him a bit um, and studied him of the changes that he's making at Twitter and, and what you what you see is, what's, what's, what's your take? Yeah, I, you know, an important disclaimer on this is that I, I never spoke to him about social networks. We only ever spoke about payment networks and PayPal and that early experience, right? And so I never had, you know, it's not been a subject of conversation between us. I don't think the word Twitter ever came up once in my in my discussions with him. Um, what I would say is, is though, taking a step back, you know, I'll, I'll give you an, an example that made sense to me that might not have made sense from the outside looking in if you didn't have all this time sort of traipsing around this world. You know, he used this um, expression when he was emailing or sending a note to some Twitter employees and it got reported on because somebody leaked it. And it was this phrase, maniacal urgency. 
you know, he said, I operate with maniacal urgency and I expect everybody else to do the same. And I think, you know, the way it was interpreted by some people was, wow, isn't this guy sort of being too intense or he's demanding too much of people. But what I saw was precisely the style of management and, and pace that characterized every startup he's ever done. From, from Zip2, which was his first effort, which was sort of a yellow pages for the internet. It's a bad description of it because he had bigger ambitions, but it became kind of like a yellow pages for the internet all the way through to Tesla and SpaceX. And what, what you see at, at PayPal, and I think what you're starting to see at Twitter is this idea that like, the point is to, to set unreasonable demands, to try to hit those demands, and to move just so much more quickly than a traditional large company could. Now, the challenge I think at Twitter is, it was, it was a traditional large public company, right? So thousands of employees, lots of different processes and structures but he has brought to it the same energy that I saw in the PayPal story. I'll tell you a, a quick anecdote from the book that you know, sort of illustrates the point. I had I interviewed a lot of early engineers from X.com. Now these are people who had never been interviewed about their experience there before. I was sometimes the first person to ever ask them about that period in their lives, which by the way, like left me gobsmacked. I was like, why wouldn't more people reach out to these people? But it turns out they're kind of hard to find and you have to earn their trust before they'll talk to you. But to an engineer, one of the things that they said is that they enjoyed this period at x.com as maniacally urgent as it was and here's why they said for two reasons one they said i did more work and some of the best work during that period than i ever thought possible like i did more in three months than i ever thought i could the second is they said elon never just issued an order and then walked away or went home he was there longer working longer hours than all of us were and i, I think that's really important the way he leads at, at, and it's been true at twitter is he will be there at all hours. He will be putting more pressure on himself than he will put on other people. And I know that there's, you know, there's criticisms this way and that about what he's doing, but I can tell you just as an observer, this is exactly what I saw or learned about the X.com experience was that he intends to work night and day to make it successful and that the pace will be very, very, very fast. And this has been true at SpaceX and at Tesla. And so I, I think, you know, we, we sort of act like, oh, like that's, you know, how can he do it? Or he can't pull, you know, but I, I would be hard pressed to bet against him. He's a pretty, you know, he's an incredible track record of doing these things. But I think one of the things that he does is he creates a pressure cooker and that's not for everybody. It's not the ideal work environment for every human being on the planet, but for a particular kind of engineer who wants to build something, build it quickly, get rapid feedback, keep moving toward a big goal, that can be a very energizing thing, right? I mean, that is that is an elite sports team to, to take the analogy into a different domain. It, it's the difference between, you know, playing in the major leagues and playing peewee baseball. And I think that's like sometimes lost in the discussion about Twitter. I think part of it, honestly, is that people are also attached to the product they have and they have some preconceptions about who he is and they don't quite get his humor. But I would say more than anything, what I learned from the PayPal experience is that startups have to be maniacally urgent because they are generally fighting very powerful, very well capitalized incumbents. So the only thing you have is speed and ridiculous audacious goals. And again, for a certain kind of person, that is the best work environment they could imagine for a period of their careers. Tyler Cowen and Daniel Gross came out with a book last year called Talent. And Tyler's been a guest on the show talking about that book. You mentioned talent before and how they were exceptionally good about attracting talent to both X.com and Confinity. Tell me a bit about what they did to recruit, interview, convince to join that company. Why was it such a pool of exceptional talent? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Tyler. Tyler was a big uh, – he was he, he, was one of the first people to read the book when it was finished. He blogged about it. He's been wonderful throughout. And I cannot recommend Talent, his book, more. I mean, it, it's just it's just exceptional. Um, he is somebody who spends a lot of time around talented people. And he and Daniel have written, like, what I think is basically like the user's guide for talent, right? I mean, it's amazing. Um, one of the things that I, I would say, to, to, to more directly answer your question, this was a place that, you know, it had some peculiar recruiting mechanisms. Um, let's let's start with the sort of obvious one, which is the earliest employees were mostly uh, on the Confinity side, certainly friends of the founders. 
Now, there's some fair criticism of that that could be made, except for the following. When Confinity is getting started, the demand for talent in Silicon Valley is at its peak. This is before the dot-com bubble bursting. And so they have a hard time recruiting against companies that are offering a lot more money, a lot more equity. And so who do they have to recruit? Their friends. Why? Because as David Sachs put it, our friends are the only people who would come to work for us. It turned out, though, that these people had friends who were massively talented. And I, and I think it actually gives, uh, there, there's a section in the book where I talk about there's a, a person, he's not, he's not one of the sort of bold faced names, his name is David Wallace. You know, David says, if I had joined a company where I didn't know these people, where they weren't my friends, I would have had more difficulty speaking up. But one of the things that made PayPal special was that I could speak up because I had known these people for so long. And other, a couple of other people identified that. They said, you know, that trust actually produced this kind of speed. Like, because they trusted one another, they could move more quickly. And a lot of what would call like throat clearing or like preamble, you didn't need a lot of that because you could just move more quickly and you trusted that this person had your back. That's kind of one, one thing. The second thing is they, they looked, they, they hired for people who, and, I, and again, there's some ways that they knew what they were doing and some ways that they didn't, but they hired for people. <laughs> Max left in his gray line. He says, the best person in any job is the person that believes that this will be their last time they work for someone else. And so they're almost sort of reluctantly joining you because they're going to go off and build their own thing after they take advantage of you for a little while. And you might think that that's like questionable loyalty to a company. But I think what Max and Peter and this team recognized is that they weren't looking for loyalists. They weren't looking for people who saw this as like a lifetime job or a lifelong goal. They were looking for people who were essentially going to come in, use PayPal and that experience to like do something consequential and then move on and start their own thing. And surprise, surprise, a lot of them did. Actually, one of my funnier interview experiences was when I was interviewing Jawad Kareem, who later went on to found, co-found YouTube um, with, uh, with Steve Chen and, and, uh, and Chad Hurley. And John would say, you know, even when I was at PayPal, I was sort of moonlighting, like building my own other thing on the side, right? And I had numerous of these kinds of interactions where you talk to somebody like, yeah, I would do PayPal during the day and I was doing, you know, a graduate degree at night or something. And this is an intense startup. So you sort of had people who, they, they had a, a kind of, a, an ability to question authority even when they got in the door and their mode of questioning authority was, I'm gonna be here, I'm not gonna be here forever, I'm gonna help you build this thing and then I want out, right? They're almost reluctant employees and in, in sort of one expression of, the, of it would be one way to express it, I think. The final thing I would say is, um, and this is particular to the engineering group, and I'm not sure that this practice is always the best, and I'm not sure that there's not better ways to interview people now. But at the time, one of the things that the engineers did is they would do a lot of elaborate puzzle solving, right? So you would get asked all these elaborate puzzles. And, and I think there's been some fair criticism of this practice. I mean, I know investment banking consulting companies do this too but one of the things that when i when i dug into it more max legend identified he said you know you look at one of these puzzles like a math problem and he said what it really is is a is an elemental computer science problem because i don't i don't i want you to get the right answer it's important that you get the right answer but i care a great deal more about how you get to it and if you get to it through this sort of meandering long you know inventing your own calculus to do it you're probably not going to be great for what we need, because what we need is efficiency. We need you to be right, and we need you to get there super quickly, right? And he said, you have to sort of recognize that most of these puzzles, there's some kind of trick, some kind of hack. And ultimately, what we're looking for are people who can identify those hacks you know, within a, 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 a morass of computer science code, right? And so there was some method to the mayhem of asking puzzles, but it also, what happened is that they, could, they, they had this candidate come in, for example, with a PhD in mathematics. And he like did the long, you know, winding answer and he got the right answer, but Max right away said, this isn't somebody I can hire because what he's going to do is slow us down. And, and again, I don't think that any of this is perfect. We also have to add the caveat that all these people were basically in their like early to mid twenties when they were building PayPal. So none of this was something they were sort of applying from years and years of experience, but I hope that gives a flavor to some of the hiring and some of why they were able to amass this quantity of talent. The world should have more books like this that, talk about a company and go through several years of its history and do all the players. I'd like to hear from you as an author, what do you see as the market for books like this? Is it, is it a tough sell? I mean, PayPal is such a big company, but is it a tough sell selling a book about a company as opposed to one charismatic you know, superhero 
Jeff Bezos or um, some concept? What's the market for books about a company? Yeah, it's great. I'm, I'm sort of smiling and, and uh, a little bit while you ask the question because, you know, I, I'm like any author. I wish the market was was many orders of magnitude bigger, obviously. <laughs> but um, and, I, and look, thank you for helping to expand that market in your own way by having me on your podcast. Look, that's great. Um, here's, what, here's what I would offer, though. So I, I had I have the following things going. The, the book has done well, and it's also done well abroad. And I think, you know, the reason is sort of self-evident, which is I'm writing about people who today are in many, in some cases, billionaires and famous and controversial and in the news all the time. I understand why people are drawn to the book for those reasons. But what I would say is I also have gotten the response from people who are in startups that it it actually captures, call it the energy of a startup, right? Or the feeling of what it's like to be in a startup. And that's the feedback I love to hear most because those people don't have any reason to tell me that, so they're, being, they're being honest, but a lot of them work in startups and they get the same sensation or vibe that they get where they're working from the book. You ask the question, like, what's the market? Um, the nice thing about business is business has been around a long time. Business is gonna continue to be around a long time. And there are business books that have done very, very well where they are the story of an individual company. One really good example and a really good book for somebody that needs something else to read is The Everything Store by Brad Stone. It's an exceptional look at the earliest days of Amazon and of who Jeff Bezos is and how he operates. So I would say the market for a book like this is big. It is it is also big, to my surprise, it's bigger, in some ways it's bigger abroad, right? So. I've had, the, the book is like, I found out it's like in a library in Kathmandu, right? <laughs> like it's on all these places I didn't expect. There's a whole group of people who are in Africa reading the book. The book's taken off in India, Germany, Singapore. Um, and I think part of the reason is Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley's halo may have diminished a little bit in the United States, but it has not diminished at all abroad. Other people look up to our country's tech success and they want to replicate it. So I'm pleased with how the book has been received. And of course, like everybody wants to be at Harry Potter levels, right? Like, of course, I wish the founders was like Harry Potter. Um, it, it maybe will get there. Maybe it won't. Um, but I think the nice thing about this particular story is there's a lot more in it than just business. You know, I think in reading it, I hope what, what struck you was also some of the personal stories, some of the gems, some of Elon's kind of near-death experiences, some of just the, the personal challenges that people face when they're working in a company like this. You know, this group went through 9-11 together, and I document that the emotional effect that that had on the company. And so, you know, it's a long way to answer your question. But thankfully, the market's been good. Um, these people continue to be in the news. And I, I think people are learning things from the book that, that maybe they didn't know before about these people. One of the fun things for me about the book is learning how – a few things that you think would just kind of have existed forever or just came out of the the earth or something were invented largely or at least popularized by by PayPal like the the thing where when you set up a new bank account and then they do like a, a d deposit this random two numbers under a dollar and then you have to report it they invented that and the captcha they didn't invent it but they kind of popularized it as a way to reduce fraud Tell me a little bit about how, you know, what you were surprised about when you were learning about PayPal and the kind of inventiveness and innovation that they had there. Yeah, no, I'm, it's like my favorite, if there's one sort of favorite thing I have about the book, it is, it is discovering exactly what you just described. Um, you know, it's like, it's cool to study the, the people who are in the news every day, certainly, and it's great to get time with them and talk to them. But the, the best part for me about studying this story was discovering how many things that kind of dot the internet landscape today were invented or popularized at PayPal. And I would say like more, more importantly, like how random to some degree that invention can be and how like chaotic it can be. Like you identified one example, which is the CAPTCHA. So everybody, everybody listening has gone through the experience of like you have to find some fire hydrants or stoplights or something within a bunch of big images. That structure is known as the CAPTCHA. And PayPal on its own, not knowing that there was a version of this available that Carnegie Mellon had worked on, on its own, there were two people, Max Levchin and David Gausebeck, who, who create what's called the, the gausebeck levchin test. And it's a way of distinguishing a computer from a human. And why do you want to distinguish a computer from a human? Well, because when PayPal was suffering fraud, a lot of times that fraud was coming by way of bots. 
automated services that were creating fake accounts because those fake accounts could capitalize on the bonuses that PayPal was giving away to, to grow. And so they had to figure out, like, is this account real? Is Joe Smith real? Or is Joe Smith a computer based in Russia that's trying to create a fake account so they can take $10? In order to do that, Max Levchin and David Gazebek build this thing where they discovered that at the time, computers are not good at like looking at text that's behind other text or behind some other images. And you had in time, in order to sign up for PayPal, you had to be able to do that. So you, the human being, would have to confirm that you were a human being. I like I didn't know where that came from. None of us do. It's not like we look around and think like, oh, these are things have an, an origin story. But it turns out the origin story is is hilarious and, and amazing, and it's designed to solve a real problem. I would say that to take a step back, your question is a, is a really, you phrased your question exactly right because there's actually a great quote, a meditation in the book about there's this is an engineer named Eric Klein, and he said, you know, at PayPal, I learned to to invent, not sort of research and then create or research and then develop. And he said, you there's a difference. He said. If you look at a problem and you try to invent your way out of it, you're actually asking a different set of questions than if you see a problem, go to Google, try to find the answer, and then solve it and, and apply the answer you find, meaning. And so it's an interesting, he said, it's an interesting distinction. He says, because you might burn a lot of time on the invention stuff. You know, you might end up actually going down a bunch of blind alleys, but you might also, you know, create the captcha. There was no off the shelf solution for fraud, for a lot of the fraud that PayPal faced. They had to invent a lot of these fixes. And I think that for me, where the magic of the book is, or like the magical moments in the book are in the moments where somebody just has an invention or something they create. And there's a, you know, a bunch of different roads to that creation. But I think of that inventive energy as like actually one of the things that startups are allowed to do because startups have permission to look at something and say, well, like what's the invention that could get us out of this? And actually one of the, the, the way that meditation on invention concludes from Eric Klein is he says, I still do that to this day. I will ask myself, what is some invention that could get us out of this situation? And so it's stuck with him ever since. And he's done other things in technology since then. And I, I think of it as like actually a word that's underutilized when we talk about these companies. But there is something distinct and something different about inventing versus researching and implementing. Tell me a bit about the how. So clearly you interviewed many, many of these key players, but then you also you know, mentioned in the book how you had access to some of the early company records. Can you say a bit more about that? Like, did you kind of read every email that Reed Hoffman received or sent or just a sample of those? Like, what was your archival research like? Yeah, it was crazy. I'll... Uh... This is worth a, a an explanation for how I even got these records. You know, this wasn't I didn't break in anywhere and, and swipe a bunch of paper. Um, I was doing an interview with somebody and at the end of the interview, he said, listen, I, you know, I have this like big archive of all these emails I kept. I'm sure it's in some folder somewhere, or some zip drive or something. You know, would you want that? And I had to kind of act nonchalant. You know, I had to sort of pretend like this wasn't a big deal when in fact it was a huge deal. Um, I said, sure, yeah, you know, why not? If you, if you get find time, I sent him a thank you note after the interview and he replies and he sends me a bunch of Dropbox links and the Dropbox links contain several gigabytes worth of his email from the time. And they're in some like ancient outlook format. And I qu quickly downloaded them and I have them, you know, I worked to convert them into sort of contemporary file formats, found some software that could actually open them up and it was pay dirt. It gave me every email that the company sent to all of its employees over a four-year period i had the company newsletter i had elon's resignation note after he left the company i had peter's note announcing the resignation i had the notes after september 11th all of these different things that brought the company to life for me and what i did is i would i would where i really started and this is interesting you asked this question i'm just reflecting on it now where i started was anything that was sent to all at x.com or all at paypal.com, or like a, a kind of broadcast message that was broadcast far and wide. Because I wasn't just trying to write the book from one person's perspective, right? This wasn't a book about Elon or a book about Max. I was trying to capture like the widest possible story I could. So what's the way you do that? You look at the, the emails that went to everybody, right? Because that would have been the information that all those people heard and saw. So I would start with those, and I would, what I did actually just to keep myself sane, 
and probably kill a few trees in the process is I printed everything out. So I had these big document folders, I mean like massive, like multiple hundreds of, I mean thousands and thousands of page of material. And I would get them bound at, at FedEx and I just would go, I mean, honestly, you asked the question, here's the boring answer. I went through every page. I would go and just wake up in the morning and I would do another hundred pages and then another hundred and another hundred, and another hundred. And this went on for years and years and years because I didn't want to miss anything. I was a little neurotic about it. And I also found that like the more I read, the more I learned. And the more I read, the more valuable my interviews became because I could point to specific moments or instances or remind somebody of a fact and then like totally bring that section to life, right? And and I'd also find gems. Like I remember I remember finding this gem about um, there's this there's this moment where the company is going through a crisis in the summer of 2000 and Elon is trying to motivate everybody to work harder. And he sends out this note that sort of outlines like what the company is up against and what he's going to do. And then his sign off in it is like, work like hell, comma, Elon. And I remember including that in the middle of the book, you know, that note and, and the sign off, just because it was so, you know, it's so consistent with his character today. And it's sort of like it was just so off the like, I just didn't expect that, you know, you, you sort of don't expect to see that. So I was able to take things like that and incorporate it into the book. But the, the answer to your question is I would go through as many, I went through as many pages as I possibly could. I tried to make sure, you know, personal stuff stayed personal, but I tried to look at emails that were sent to everyone for the most part and draw on them to illustrate the picture, you know, while, while understandably protecting people's privacy and protecting different things that I thought were just important to protect. Um, but that's how I approached it. And I had these big folders and binders and I would just turn every single page and I had a robust system of highlighting and tabbing these pages so that I could make sure they were used well. And then I went back later when I was doing the fact checking and I would download PDFs of anything that I thought where I cited something and make sure that the person I was work with, working with on fact checking saw that I didn't just make up the quote, that it wasn't, I didn't pull this out of thin air and I would stick those into a Google Drive and they could go back and make sure that I had appropriately and accurately drawn those quotes in but that email archive is the difference between this book being written depending on hazy memories and being able to look directly at what peter tells the company after 9 11 and see what he says and then understand the impact of that uh, and so i hope that that addresses the question it does peter Thiel, incredibly successful investor in the book you talk about you show how he was a reluctant CEO didn't really want to manage people, kept looking for time to get out of that role. Um, he, you present him as the, you know, an excellent chess player, a superb judge of talent. Is these like insights on the macro economy and manages to secure funding right before the dot com bust starts. What, having met him and, and studied him, what would you say is his superpower? It's talent identification. Um, and at least that's my opinion of his superpower because time and time again throughout his career, he has an uncanny ability to find somebody that, it, that, that a, a ends up doing amazing things. But the difference in their life comes when Peter is in front of them and offers help. And I would say help can come in many forms. Sometimes it's the help of an introduction Sometimes it's the help of, of him investing in somebody. And I would say that multiple employees told me that the thing that, that he did that changed their lives was just sketching out a vision of their career that was bigger than what they thought it could be. And, and I don't think this is something that's talked about enough. I think Tyler Cowan talks about it in talent. But the biggest thing that, that, that you know, sets Peter apart, and I'm not sure, by the way, that I have a good answer as to where this skill comes from, but it is the skill is seeing people who have this outsized talent and then just finding a way to make help them be successful. And this is Max Levchin, uh, it's Mark Zuckerberg, it is dozens of PayPal employees, it is you know the founding team of Palantir, it's the people who work at Founders Fund. And I think of it as a real gift. And I think it's something that, you know, he may, it may be intuition for him. Tyler, Tyler has spoken in particular about how some of it must be intuitive. Um, but that is the, the secret. And it's one of the things that I would say, if somebody were to take something away from the book, one of the things I've taken away from the book and from Peter's method of hiring and recruiting is the following. He would often cut against type 
when it came to selecting somebody for a position. A great example is that he names Roloff Botha as CE CFO of the company when it's about to go public. Now, Roloff is all of like, I think, 25 or 26 years old when he's given that title. And some other uh, some of the board members push back on Peter and they say, listen, like you're you're going to you're going to put somebody in this job. He's 25, 26. He's just finished business school. Wall Street's going to eat him alive. And Peter, to his credit, says, no, Roloff is the one who built the model for the company. He knows our numbers inside and out. And we trust that he actually knows how this business runs and works and that he can present it quite capably. And of course, today, Roloff both as the head of Sequoia Capital, right? So it, it all it all worked out and the IPO worked out well. And Peter was right. But part of what he had to do in that situation is push back against the board that had a certain kind of call it cut from central casting way of thinking about hiring and, and about recruiting. And there are moment after moment, you know, there's a lawyer, um, Rebecca Eisenberg, who's just been fired from a job. She's very political. She's in the public eye. And, you know, Peter hires her and she helps to shepherd the IPO. And she even admitted to me later, she's like, you know, I wasn't probably the person that somebody would put at the top of a list to do something like that. But Peter believes in me. And so there's this way in which it's like sometimes I think the important thing that I've taken away is to, to just suspend my judgment about somebody based on background, history, the way they look, the way they talk. I think Peter does that instinctively. And I saw it in this story and heard it from the employees directly. Now, you spent time at McKinsey earlier in your career. A lot of listeners of the show are consultants. Tell us a little bit about your experience there and maybe how it's informed your career as an author. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And actually, as I was thinking back on it, when you and I were speaking earlier, McKinsey, you know, I was sort of working my days at McKinsey and then nights and weekends were spent writing my proposal for my first book, which was Rome's Last Citizen, which is a book about Roman history. And so it's interesting because my author life started at McKinsey. And, and I'll say I'll say two things about that. The first is I think part of it is like I wasn't the happiest consultant around. Uh, and so I was sort of finding a way to moonlight on something that was more creative than I wanted to do. And of course, it all all worked out. But the second thing I would say is, you know, for me, what McKinsey taught me to be was it taught me to be a very, very, very good professional and to have high expectations for what somebody delivers to clients. And, you know, you could look, people can, people kind of criticize consulting if they're in it, they'll criticize consulting from the outside. But I think there are very few places in the world that teach you to be as detail oriented, as kind of uh, energetic about your work, to work quite as hard. You know, we were working long days and nights and things. And I learned all that from McKinsey. I think the other thing that I learned is just how to break down a problem into its component parts and how to explain it to a client in a clear and methodical way. And what is writing, right? Is breaking down a story into its component parts and then explaining it back to a reader in, in, I would say, a clear and methodical way and hopefully as you get better, an entertaining way, right? You want to, you don't want this to be like doing homework. And so for me, you know, I don't, I can't say that McKinsey was like super tied into my life as an author, but I, I think some of it came over by osmosis. I learned, for example, how not to just think of my books as like artistic creations, but to think of them as products and to think of myself as a CEO, right? So if, if you're a CEO of a company and you have one product, you know, you sort of think about it a little differently than if you see yourself as an artist who produces this artistic work and then depends on other people to sell it. Um, my books have done well. Part of the reason they have done well is because I take the time and invest the time to talk about them and to share them and to do things that are going to expand the audience. Those skills were in part what I learned from consulting, which is how do you do, how do, you, how do, you do math to figure out what you need to sell to do, do X, Y, and Z? Um, I, I also will say I met some of the best and smartest people that I've ever worked with professionally in consulting. I would say for young people, particularly for young people who are listening, like the, the, the reason to join a consulting company, if you want to do that, is really not because of the work, it's because of relationships. Like when you're like working long hours with really, really, really smart people, you just have to step up the, your game. I just, I this person I worked with, his name is Craig Kessler. Um, and, and Craig, you know, he's gone on to have a great career, but Craig was like, like at the time I thought I was smart when I was coming to McKinsey and then I met Craig and Craig was just like head and shoulders above me in how he presented himself and how he communicated, how he talked to clients. So all of that, I mean, it was basically when you're that young, you, you can't have a, in some ways a better education, uh, particularly if you plan to be in business or around business. I mean, it just, it taught me to be a professional uh, and I'm grateful for it. I'm curious to hear about your portfolio in terms of 
in addition to writing books, is that your sole so focus? Or do you also do kind of speaking gigs, paid speaking gigs, or any consulting or advisory work or in anything else? Or is it kind of pure play writing your next book? No, no, no. It's, not, it's definitely not pure play. This book was written, you know, on, on I would say not nights and weekends, but mornings and weekends. Um, because I, I'm not quite Prince Harry yet. And so I, I'm not, I'm not going to book... Uh, book a 400,000 book sale on a single day number, not yet anyway, in time. Um, I said to become a royal first and then turn around and leave the royal family. Uh, so, so no, wh- the way I chunk up my time is, uh, I would say there's sort of my book life and my non-book life. My book life is writing books and then paid speaking and kind of traveling around the country and just talking to different groups. And, you know, I was just at CES and I'm going to be at Utah Tech Week in just a little bit and do all these other things. Um, and that's fun. It's a chance to share the stories. Many of the stories that don't make it into the book are the most fun to share stories to share, right? So that's kind of half of my, roughly half my time, maybe a little less. Um, and then I also, you know, sort of do, do my day job. Like I, I'm a consultant and I do a lot of speech writing and ghost writing for people. So I am engaged with companies and individuals to communicate their messages and to think about how they're going to do it better. Uh, and that's, that's, that's great work. And, you know, it's like, a, it's a nice balancing act because I find that at least for me with writing and writing books, there are authors who dream of spending all day writing. But if you can get three to four hours in in a day, you'll have plenty of, you'll be able to get plenty of, of writing work done before you go do other work. And that balance has always worked for me. What is coming out next? What are you working on? Yeah, it's, um, I, I can't share the idea, but I can sort of share that, you know, part of the challenge of writing books is that you can get, pretty lonely like if you were in a room like imagine you know imagine what the substance of the work is like you sit by yourself and you turn over pages of old emails for years like your life gets pretty pretty bland pretty fast and so i've found in the past the cure for that has been co-writing working on books with other authors i admire and there was a young author well, young he's around my age right? but his friend of mine named jeff kane he did a book on samsung and we just started talking about ideas like we'd have these the calls about just like oh what do you want to work on what are you thinking about and we sort of landed on an idea. We've just finished a proposal for a topic that's in tech history, and we'll see if the publisher bites. I think they will, and hopefully I'll be back on in a few years with you to talk about it. Open invitation. Jimmy, this has been an amazing conversation, so much fun. Where can listeners find you online? I mean, obviously they can go buy the book at their favorite bookstore, but if they want to follow you, what's the best place? Yeah, it's, it's one of two places where I'm most active. One is Twitter, where I'm at Jimmy A. Sony, and the other is LinkedIn, where you can just look up my first and last name and find me there. And uh, and I love I, like I love hearing from and reading, uh, engaging with readers. It's a ton of fun. I like the back and forth a lot. Uh, and I you know it's it's one of the best parts of this whole thing is actually seeing what people make of the book, which is why your questions are great. Like you you got me to reflect on things that I, I hadn't thought about in a while. So that's where people can find me online. And I hope to hear from people. Thank you very much. So it's the founders, the story of PayPal and the entrepreneurs who shaped Silicon Valley. It's one of the Umbrex best books on technology. I love this book and amazing conversation. Go, go buy the book. You should. We'll include Jimmy's links in the show notes. Jimmy, thank you so much for joining today. Will, thank you for having me. This was great.